right back at it. Uh, paper two, the Cold War. Today, we're going to talk about the nuclear arms race during the Cold War conflict. Uh, so let's start with the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, this obviously goes back to the Second World War, where the United States would be the first nation to actually use nuclear weapons in a, a wartime situation. We developed bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to ultimately end the Second World War. But recall that we've got debates over whether or not that was a military necessity versus an early act in the Cold War to show the Soviet Union what we were capable of. The United States would consider in the years after the droppings of the atomic bombs that our atomic monopoly uh, was a vital counter to the larger conventional forces that the Soviet Union had stationed in Europe. But this came to an end in 1949 when the Soviet Union would test their own bomb. Now, as we push into the 1950s and as the United States lost their nuclear monopoly, the United States would speed the development of even bigger bombs, detonating a hydrogen bomb in 1952. These hydrogen bombs were a thousand times more powerful than the earlier weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, making the, the Cold War threats of nuclear war uh, being even more uh, devastating. The Soviet Union responded with their own hydrogen bomb test in 1953. And through the remainder of the 1950s, their, both countries uh, would, would test other weapons, culminating in the Soviet Union in 1961, detonating what was known as Tsar Bomba, uh, the largest bomb ever detonated in the world at over 50 megatons of explosive power. Um, this, is, this is more than 5,000 times bigger than the bombs dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Soviet Union often uh, wanted to develop these larger weapons because their accuracy and delivery systems wasn't as good as the United States. So a bigger bomb could make up for deficiencies in accuracy. Um, here you can see a representation of the, uh, the size of the mushroom clouds that were created from these, these tests. The Mike and Bravo uh, were, were early tests of American hydrogen bombs. You can see Tsar Bomba. And over here, the, over there, these little circles, that would be the Hiroshima uh, bomb and the, the Trinity test, the first testing of an atomic bomb. So obviously the, the uh, the Cold War situation ramped up with far more devastating weapons. Now the arms race turns to delivery systems. How are we going to get these weapons to their destination? Um, in the beginning, uh, and with Hiroshima and beyond, these bombs were going to be delivered by airplanes, large bombers that could easily be targeted by enemy anti-aircraft weapons. This will give way to the, the development of missile systems, long range missile systems, as evidenced by the Soviet launch of Sputnik in October of 1957, that shows that the Soviet Union has long range missile capabilities. The first nuclear ICBMs would be deployed in 1958 by the Soviet Union and in the next year by the United States. These were intercontinental ballistic missiles that could take a nuclear warhead from Soviet territory to the United States. Later, uh, nuclear sub-launched ballistic missiles, where you could put a nuclear warhead on a submarine and, and send it to any uh, corner of the oceans, um, would be developed in the 1960s by both the United States and the Soviet Union, allowing now the creation of what can be known as the nuclear triad. Um, bombers, stationary uh, missile silos, uh, with long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles, and then the sub-launch ballistic missiles, where none of the, the three corners of that triad could be knocked out simultaneously, so there was always a missile threat. The Soviets and the Americans also worked to develop anti-ballistic missile systems since the 1950s, and by late 1960s, early 70s, both sides had developed nuclear anti-ballistic missiles. Uh, to counter the anti-ballistic missiles, the MIRV, a, a, a multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicle, one long-range missile that can break into multiple nuclear warheads, 
uh, was developed by the first the United States in 1970 and the Soviet Union in 1975. And this was made to, to thwart the, the, the danger posed by anti-ballistic missiles. Now, kind of interestingly, anti-ballistic missiles um, are, are, are weapons that obviously were defensive in nature, but in reality could make the Cold War situation a little bit more tense. And that brings us to talking about the strategies that were deployed by the United States during this Cold War um, nuclear arms race. So as Hiroshima shows, the, these weapons were absolutely devastating. And the weapons were so bad that they were more so seen as deterrence to war throughout the Cold War era. President Eisenhower would do this through what uh, was known as massive retaliation and his brinkmanship policy. This idea of using a massive retaliatory threat to avoid the threat of future war. Um, the, the idea of an all out nuclear attack would actually prevent war. That was Eisenhower's belief. And this worked in the 1950s. Uh, the United States was able to get China, for example, to back down from threats against Taiwan. Now, when President Kennedy comes into office in 1961, he and his Secretary of Defense draft a new uh, strategy called flexible response. Concerns over, over two bad choices, all-out nuclear war or humiliation, if the United States didn't stand behind their threats, led the Kennedy administration to, to create this more flexible response of growing our conventional armies but also still having a powerful nuclear arsenal that we would continue to grow. McNamara also developed what was known as the counterforce strategy using battlefield nuclear weapons, like we see above me here, tactical nuclear weapons, smaller weapons that could be used against armies rather than strategic weapons to be used against cities. But it's the Cuban Missile Crisis that shows really to both sides that this idea of a limited nuclear war was unrealistic. How could you trust that each side would be rational uh, to, to keep a limited nuclear war truly limited? And this returns to the, the strategy of strategic bombing of, of enemy cities and the development of what is known as MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. This idea that if nobody would survive a nuclear confrontation, nobody would start one. And this becomes an unwritten rule of the nuclear arms race, you know, building such a massive arsenal of weapons that neither side would ever be willing to use them for fear of being destroyed themselves. Interestingly, as I mentioned, anti-ballistic missiles would limit the prospect of MAD. If the United States had better anti-ballistic missiles than the Soviets, the idea of mutually assured destruction might be might disappear, and that could actually make the Cold War a more tense scenario. In the 1980s, tensions will ratchet up uh, even further with the impact of the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan came into office in 1981, promising to rebuild American military after it had, had shrunk in the 1970s um, and created new military uh, developments towards uh, new weapons delivery systems. Uh, this called for an in uh, increase in American military spending, new weapon systems like the stealth bomber, um, and what was known as the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, called by the media Star Wars. Um, this would be putting anti-ballistic missile systems up into space to shoot incoming missiles down with lasers. This is all purely theoretical. It never actually happened. Uh, it was far too expensive. We're not even sure if it would have worked, but the United States did pour billions of dollars into this development and this ratcheted up those tensions as if this worked that prospect of mutually assured destruction might disappear. And so in those early 1980s, fears of a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union would actually peak once again. We're gonna close it off there in a later video when we talk about detente and the end of the Cold War. We're gonna talk about how both sides worked to, to limit some of the threats of nuclear war, including Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev towards the end of the Cold War story. We'll see you on another day.